Hello, my name is Kate van Andel. I'm with Adrock, a company in Edinburgh, Scotland. And I'll be talking about subsurface temperature measurement using electromagnetic waves and machine learning for enhanced oil recovery. My collaborators are Colin Stove, Michael Robinson and Gordon Stove, also with Adrock. And since we won't be in Amsterdam, in December, I present you with a picture of us. Structure of my talk is as follows. I'll start with some background and motivation of this work. Then I'll discuss electromagnetic and borehole field measurements that we will use for our results. Then I'll explain our machine learning approach. I'll discuss the results and we'll give a brief conclusion and outline uh, future work. Enhanced oil recovery is a, a well-known method to increase the yield of oil reservoirs. Typically, you are able to extract 60% more oil using some of these methods. The basic uh, methodology is to reduce viscosity and increase mobility ratio to make the oil flow easier so you can pump it out. Several enhanced oil recovery methods are in use. Uh, gas injection is a method that we will not discuss. Instead, we'll focus on thermal methods. Um, it, the principle here is to, to heat the materials containing the oil to make the oil seep out and then you uh, scoop it up. A common method to, uh, to this is by steam injection. So you basically drill a hole, put a pipe in there and uh, put steam in there to uh, liquefy the oil. Then it forms a sort of a puddle on the ground and then you just suck it up. Of course, many things can go wrong. Um, the, the steam can go in the wrong direction. Uh, the temperature uh, could be too high or too low or in the, the wrong place. So in order for this to work well and be safe, I mean, that steam, if it, if it emerges at the wrong place, could easily injure people. Uh, you have to monitor the, uh, the temperature in the subsurface. And this is conventionally done using temperature observation wells, TOWs. So you drill a hole, uh, and then you insert a thermometer at various depths and you get a temperature profile. The same principle is that you measure the uh, turkey at uh, Thanksgiving. You stick a um, uh, sort of a, um, uh, a probe in there with a temperature sensor at the tip. So the typical cost of such a measurement is about 5,000 per well, and uh, there's no production during the measurement. For this reason, it's done not very frequently, about three to four times a year. So uh, if something goes wrong in the meantime, uh, bad luck. So for this reason, there is a, uh, there's a need to do this better. So how ideally would you like to uh, measure these subsurface temperatures? Well, we want to do it without drilling using surface data, measurements only on the surface. We would like to do the measurements without well downtime. downtime. We like a faster acquisition. The, uh, the TOW measurements are kind of slow. Um, you basically have to slowly lower a temperature in the, in the borehole. And ideally do it a lot more frequent than three to four times a year, perhaps even on a, a monitor it on a continuous basis. All this, of course, translates into low cost per measurement. And uh, finally, it would be nice if we had easy data processing. For example, you don't want to do like a full resistivity survey and send your data to some processing center and get, get the reconstructions or the inversions back next week. It's possible, but it's not on the wish list. So what we have done is deploy the pulsed radar subsurface imaging system we've developed at Adrock to address this problem. 
So I'll give a few details of our system. It's a form of ground penetrating radar, but it's quite different from what you usually think when we uh, hear this term. First of all, our frequency is much lower than normal. It's about one to three megahertz. It's a, it's a center frequency of the pulse. So it means the wavelength in air is about 100 meters. Um, so this similar systems have been used uh, uh, on Greenland and on the Antarctic to map the, uh, the rock bed under the ice, also on Mars uh, from orbit actually, uh, also with penetration depths of several kilometers. In the materials under consideration here, we won't go uh, that deep, but we don't need to. Uh, the system is bi-static, static, so it basically means we have an emitter and a transmitter, an emitter and a detector, excuse me. And we use extensive stacking for noise reduction. Typically, we, uh, per location, we take about 100,000 shots to, to average, to stack for noise reduction. The total measurements uh, take about a few minutes per well. And the data comes in form of time series. We typically, after uh, uh, stacking, we have about 100,000 data points per well. And uh, what, so what we, we did, we acquired this data on a large producing oil field at uh, 21 wells. Those wells also had uh, operational TOWs with available temperature logs. In addition to this particular oil field, we also uh, took data at three other wells in a different oil field with different geology for reasons I'll explain shortly. And so our TOW data, the measured temperature is the ground truth. And the, we have temperature logs up to about 1400 feet down. And the goal is now from the, uh, the radar data, reconstruct the temperature profile. So how do we do that? Well, the, there is a, a known strong correlation between electromagnetic properties, uh, particularly conductivity and propagation velocity or dielectric, relative dielectric, as a function of temperature. But we don't really know the exact temperature profile, of course, and we don't know ex what the exact relation for each material is between temperature and these properties. So a physics-based uh, standard approach of creating your model and do uh, basically trying to match your theoretical prediction from the model to your measured data, standard inversion is really not practical here. So if you don't understand the physics, these days we have machine learning, which can create models without really uh, knowing anything about equations or uh, physics or anything. It's just pure data. So both our data series are time series. And from a mathematical point of view, the simple question, the simple procedure is to call our temperature log data time series T and our electromagnetic data M and just do a machine learning, apply a machine learning algorithm and train it to predict T from M. In order to see how well this works, uh, of course, any data can be matched to any data with a sufficiently large, uh, say, neural network. So um, since we have a rather small data set, only 21 uh, data points, data uh, sets, if you like, um, we use the common method of, of training on all but one of the 21 wells and using the excluded well to do a simulated blind test prediction. So we get, we do this uh, 21 times and you get 21 predictions. So we tried various machine learning algorithms and we, there's really no good motivation for which one to use, but uh, well, there are, there are motivations, but let me suffice here by saying that we finally settled down to a five layer feed forward uh, neural network with standard back propagation uh, training some enhanced gradient descent and we trained it on these MT pairs and simply predicted the, the, the wells that we were not trained on. We also included these three sites from a different location that were not used in training to make a prediction there. The reason for this is that uh, if this works and that seems to work to a certain extent 
the machine learning algorithm essentially separates, well, let me step back, what's, uh, what information is in the, in the radar data? Well, it's determined by the geology, by the materials and the temperature. So if we could keep the materials constant and vary the temperature, we have a chance. If both are varying, uh, not very much so. So the, uh, the 21 wells uh, in the oil field have a fairly homogeneous, though not perfect, geology or subsurface, but the, the three other sites were, uh, were different. And so we can expect that not to work if the machine learning algorithm really uh, separates out the constant geology from the data. And that turns out to be the case, as we will see when we go to the results section. So here are the results. So the going through this entire process, um, we plot here as a function of depth in feet on the horizontal scale and temperature in Kelvin. Obviously this was a, um, a site in the US or we would not be using these, to me, curious units. So red is the actual ground truth, the temperature well data and blue is the the prediction we're getting from going through this entire process of training, excluding each of the 21 uh, sites and doing the prediction. So we, we see that there is a reasonable correlation, most of them, there are some uh, complete misses. For example, this one is completely wrong. This one is not too great, but it, the blue line is the prediction. It did detect this peak and this one also failed for reasons that uh, we could speculate on. We don't really know, we have to do more experiments. Uh, one explanation would be, well, this is just a very unreliable method. Another explanation would be, well, the geology under, under underground and these particular three locations was sufficiently different for the algorithms to break. Um, so these locations are uh, qualitatively correct in, in finding the, the center uh, roughly of the high temperature zone due to the steam injection, but that the numbers are a bit off. This one is not very good either. Here we have some death discrepancy. So you see, it, I believe these results are encouraging, uh, but they, they require more development, which is good because that's what research is doing. And these green sites here are the, uh, the other location from a different field and it's complete failure. So uh, usually you don't like failures, but in this case, it confirms that the geology itself is quite important and this training has to be done uh, in homogeneous geology to get around this limitation. Uh, there are various things we could do, but let's just stick with these results uh, given the limited time of this talk. So uh, perhaps I'm biased, but I believe these results are quite encouraging. The three foreign wells failed, so uh, as I've said, uh, it, is as, as, it is pretty much as expected. Of course, the key question is how to proceed, how to improve. Well, there's many things we can do. So uh, if the ground conditions are not entirely homogeneous, even when they're approximately homogeneous, uh, we could possibly get around this if we can incorporate this, this data as input to the neural networks. How to do this is not entirely clear, but there is various options, uh, which I will not speculate on at this moment. Uh, also, the, uh, this particular way of uh, data fitting using neural network is maybe not optimal. Similar uh, things have been done in reconstructing NMR data from uh, well log, from uh, borehole data. Uh, from other borehole data, like uh, um, um, the, the cheap borehole data, like porosity, um, um, conductivity, um, uh, what is it, neutron, neutron, whatever. <laughs> I'm not too familiar with this technology, but the principle is very simple. You take the borehole data you have, and then you use a neural network to predict the borehole data you have not taken, especially NMR data is expensive. And you do this on a couple of locations where you have both and then you predict it. So you can find this in textbooks. It's almost, almost well established. 
method there is uses autoencoders. So we're, I'll, I'll show you one slide if I have time on how that would work. It's another approach. Finally, uh, why does this work? So uh, the temperature logs go down to about 500 meters. So do our electromagnetic waves really penetrate that deep? Well, that's unclear. We, we have no direct measurements of the absorption and losses in these materials, but 500 meters seems quite deep. It's possible it does that. But on the other hand, maybe you don't need to go that deep. Maybe if you detect, say, the, the top and the gradient of the high temperature zone, that's sufficient to predict the rest. Because another thing that's constant is the mechanism by which the high temperature zones are created by the steam injection, also site and technology specific. And so uh, there is a precedent for this kind of explanation. At some point, people thought they could image the seabed uh, from a plane or even from orbit using conventional radar. So um, how does this work? Um, these, these, uh, these conventional radar waves are not supposed to penetrate the sea. Well, it turns out, well, that's, it's not really proven, but this is a very plausible explanation, that the, the motion of the way of the, uh, the flow of the water creates uh, a pattern on the surface which images the subsurface pattern. So it's like a, a ghost image of the subsurface on the surface of the sea. And at sufficiently large time scales, um, uh, the, the Earth's surface pretty much behaves like water, it flows. So it could be similar. Um, this analogy is a little bit iffy at some places, but um, an explanation like this is another possibility. Um, let me just show you uh, one avenue uh, that we're currently exploring. And well, perhaps next year when I'm again in Amsterdam for real this time, I will show you these results. It's a, again, yet another site where we have, uh, we have 40 uh, temperature well logs, just the logs. And if we would mimic the approach that used for the NMR borehole reconstruction, we would typically um, use an autoencoder network to first uh, compress, if you like, the temperature data in this case to as few numbers as possible. So it basically means that we uh, we try to see what are the, the what's the dimension of the space of all the temperature curves. So we implemented this with a, a fairly standard autoencoder network, and it seems like with just five activations, just five numbers, uh, you can parameterize this uh, all the forty temperature profiles. Uh, very, very accurately, as you can see here. Um, so the, uh, again, the, the red are the, the ground proof temperature log values, and the blues are the predictions of the autoencoder network. So this is not really a, a prediction or anything. It just shows that instead of dealing with a time series of several hundred points for each temperature log, we can compress it down to just five numbers, the activations. Of course, this makes it easier for the neural network to perform well. Uh, these are, uh, yes. So this is uh, an avenue that we're pursuing in parallel to other enhancement, uh, particularly using uh, geological data as well as the uh, pure radar data to do the imaging. So uh, as I said, we hope to have more results to present in 2021, but what I've shown you is basically what's in our paper. And so I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I believe there's some room for live question and answers following this video. So hopefully uh, I will be there or I am here to answer those. Thank you for your attention.